Okay, we're going to continue uh, interviewing Dad. It's been several weeks. I think the last time was uh, August 22nd. It's now September the 20th, and uh, we're going to continue talking to Dad about his uh, experiences. Uh, one of Dad's best friends, especially in his early life, was a, a gentleman by the name of Parker Keith. Uh, Dad, uh, tell us about Parker and his family and well, how he affected you. Well, to begin with, uh, I met Parker Keith and John Duvall and the Duvall bunch why, uh, when I was working uh, at the relief ticket at, up at uh, Prisoner's Lake and uh, the rock quarry up there. I, I, uh, the, I was working with this uh, fellow that had been in World War One, and he had been gashed. And uh, he was very, uh, wasn't very strong at all, he was very sickly. And we'd load up the wheelbarrows and have to move them from point A to point B. And uh, and he'd get his wheelbarrow loaded up and he couldn't wheel it. So I, I was a young man at the time, so I wheeled his wheelbarrow for him, dumped it out. And I got to be friends with him and he invited me to church at uh, Church of God. And that's where I met uh, Parker Keith and the John Duvall. And, uh, and and Reuben Duval, his sister Myrtle, and uh, that's how I met Parker. So uh, uh, he, uh, Parker was a, um, he was an orphan boy. He'd been raised in an orphan's home, and his, uh, he uh, always felt sorry for him. He didn't have a home, and uh, he'd, he'd stop, he'd stop and eat with us once in a while when we lived there at 13th and Russell Street. And, uh, but anyway, him and Johnny was getting into the floor covering business. And so, uh, uh, I was going to go back in the 3C camp, and I forget what year it was, but uh, around uh, 30, uh, 37, I guess, or somewhere along the end there. And Parker says, well, I would, you should never do that, says there's no future in that, says, I'm, we're getting into the, learning how to the floor covering business, so why don't you come along? So I did, so I learned that that's how I come to be in the floor covering business. And it, it was a, uh, a good paying job and made pretty good money for all the years I worked at it. And, uh, and then uh, I know uh, I uh, worked for several companies, I worked for Tom. Thomas Sheeran when Nyad and I got married, and then after that I worked for Tom Daly, but in the meantime I got in the union, and uh, so uh, I was working at Tom Daly's, and uh, they were splitting up the work, it's kind of slow time, you know, and so uh, the business agent come out one day, his name was Hoss Hayes, and he says, uh, these guys are griping out here because you're getting as much time in as they, they think you ought to sit at home. <laughs> so, so how would you like to go to work for F.A. Camp Flooring Company? I said, boy, I'd be right down my alley because they was an established company and a well thought of, had a good reputation. So he said, well, call this fellow and he'd give me uh, uh, Frank Cabot's telephone number. And he, he said that they, they need help. And so uh, I called him and he says, uh, uh, told him who I was, and uh, he says, uh, well, uh, we got about three weeks' work, says, come by the uh, warehouse in the morning, and says, I'll, I'll talk to you. And so I did, and so I went to work for, work for him for three weeks, and I saved 38 years. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, so that, that uh, that's quite. A, I worked a lot of interesting for a lot of interesting people, a lot of interesting homes I worked in. But uh, Parker told me he says uh, he says there's a new product on the market called asphalt tile, and and and, uh, and the building uh, was starting at that time. Of course, later on when the war, why it kind of went kaput again. The, the, uh, new new construction. So, uh, but uh, we. Uh, we, we laid uh, 
my, my brother-in-law, Roy Hacker, we laid acres and acres of asphalt tile in hospitals and schools and over in southern Ohio and southern Indiana, northern Kentucky, and uh, it, it was, it, the, the uh, vocation treated me real good. And, uh, well, I'll tell you about how I met, met my wife, the girl of my dreams, and uh, Dorothy, my sister, had a party one time. She worked at the Triangle Bank Company, and Nida worked over there too. And so, uh, Dor as I said, Dorothy had a party and and uh, invited Nida over. That's the first time I met her, and uh, so uh, I got to kiss her right away. Though and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is an interesting story. Go ahead, Dad. <laughs> hey, they, they had to spin the bottle game, so uh, it's, I spin the bottle several times, never did go to her, and finally did. I said, here's a little gal I've been wanting to kiss. <laughs> so uh, I did, and, and, uh, and she was uh, a, a, great, a, a big joy in my life. I've always appreciated and I had a, and, uh, and some more people I uh, met over there, or, uh, had a party that night, but I, I can only recall about Nida. <laughs> and then Nida lived with the uh, people of uh, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Walter Fling. They lived on, I believe, 18th Street. And that's where I did my court net. And, uh, and so. Uh, um, well, Mrs. Fling just basically became a family friend of, up until her death, basically. Yes, she was, Mrs. Fling. They, they were really nice people. They were uh, treasures for the uh, for the uh, Southside Baptist Church, and they I always remember them counting the money after church on uh, on Sunday nights. And uh, I thought, well, they, they must trust me pretty good. I could rock, take everything they did, God, but uh, <laughs> of course I wouldn't do that. And uh, so uh, later, after Knight and I were married, I joined the Baptist denomination and uh, and uh, become a Christian during that time. But before that, well, we was uh, we were raised in the Methodist Church, and my uh, my mother's oldest sister. Uh, her husband, his name was Everman too, by the way, and uh, and he was a preacher at, up at a little place up West Bend where we come from, and uh, so there was a there was a, my dad had two cousins, uh, Jeff and Chester Everman, and then my dad and his uh, brother Henry married uh, one of the Everman girls, so. My grandpa Dave Barry used to say the devil owed him a debt and paid him off. Paid him off in Everman son-in-law. Of course, the the Barrys was all Democrats and uh, and the Everman was all Republicans. <laughs> that was always uh, something. Like, and, and I was at, at, uh, I was baptized by Brother O. V. Steger, O. J. Steger, and uh, he was uh, he was a lovely old man, uh, a, a great preacher, and. Uh, and uh, he come to, after we got married and got a family started, he came to visit us a couple of times, him and his wife. Actually, he performed your and mom's wedding also, yes, didn't he? Yes, at, he? yes, he did. He, at his house? At his house, yeah. Well, we never had a church wedding or anything like that because money was scarce in them days, so we then couldn't afford it. And uh, let's see what, what goes here. Okay. Well, it might be interesting to note that... Uh, uh, Mom and Dad got married on the 4th of July, presumably because it was a holiday, and then you went right back to work the next day? Oh, yeah, I did. I did, uh, <laughs> yeah, and uh, so uh, I, I worked for Thomas J. Sheeran at the time, and I know uh, uh, got to work late that morning and uh, told them <laughs> I overslept, so they had a big laugh about that. <laughs> so, uh, well, aren't you going to have to pace yourself now? <laughs> yeah. So, well, tell us, uh, tell us about uh, the uh, early uh, years of your marriage, Dad. 
Well, we uh, we we lived in uh, thirty one thirty Mark Bright Avenue in 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 Oakley, and uh, page three. Uh, that'll help. Yeah. Where's your page three? Yeah, you go ahead. We 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 lived in Oakley for two years, I guess, and uh, we'd uh, we uh, would drive on Sundays. We'd uh, go uh, go over to my mother and dad, stay all day, and we went to church at the South Side, as I said before, and that night, and uh, and we had uh, had uh, friends. Uh, the Charlie Benefees and Neil Strickers and Charles Wilson and and uh, so so many things happened at the time I, I, I just can't remember them all. Well, uh, when uh, we and then we moved from Oakley to 329 East 18th Street, where Larry was born. That's and, me, everybody. <laughs> and uh, I remember bringing her home and him home from the hospital, and uh, and uh, our, my neighbor, we sat her in a chair to carry her up the steps. We lived on the second floor, and uh, my neighbor was on one side of the chair and I was on the other, so we, we toted her up the steps on the chair, and uh, and uh, uh, well, right away, uh, I was uh, only two weeks later. Larry was only two weeks old when I went to, went to uh, Paris Island to boot camp. And uh, this was in the Marine Corps. Yeah, this is in the Mo Marine Corps, of mm -hmm. course. And uh, and uh, uh, I always liked the story when you went down there to the uh, register for the draft, and it, yeah. they had all the branches of the service out, and all the billets were filled up for the. Navy, which you wanted to go into. Uh, yeah, tell us about the uh, recruiter. No, I, I was really wanting to go into the Army. Oh. And uh, so they, uh, when I got my paper, it said U.S. Navy. And I said, well, I didn't want to go into the Navy. And there was a, an old uh, raspy voiced uh, recruiting sergeant, Marine Corps rec recruiting sergeant there. And he said, hey, buddy. Said, how would you like to get in the Marines? And I said, I believe I'd like that better in the Navy. So he said, follow me. <laughs> <laughs> Probably a decision you may have regretted. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, so I went to uh, Larry was two weeks old, like I said before, when I left for uh, uh, boot camp at Paris Island, and uh, and then. Uh, um, Oh, I finished up boot camp, and then I was uh, uh, sent to Camp Lejeune in, uh, in uh, Jacksonville, North Carolina, and uh, for uh, extra training for uh, 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 anti-aircraft anti training. I was in a searchlight platoon, and. Uh, so we uh, we had to to polish on them old searchlights, and uh, the only thing I remember about that is the the general functioning of the anti-aircraft searchlight was to keep the luminous wall of vapor, which which forms in the crater of the positive carbon at the focal point of the mirror at all times. How come me to remember all that? Like, I don't know, <laughs> but that's what I remember about that. And uh, and then uh, I uh, I would uh, come home for AOL, absent on leave, and oh. I wasn't AWOL. And uh, I suppose come to Washington D.C. and uh, I, and we uh, was kind of. The ship was going to come to, come to the south Southwest Pacific. It was laid up for boiler repairs in the Boston Navy Yard, so it, they kept putting it off. For us to go and finally, on, the, on Christmas, I thought, well, I'm going to go home. So uh, I called Night and sent me 25 bucks, <laughs> and, 
And uh, so I went A W A O L on Epsilon leave and uh, went back. I don't I, home about a week and I went back and uh, make, uh, I, I fell out for uh, roll call and the uh, the. Uh, the NCO says, uh, said, where you been? I said, well, I've been home. I had a good time. He said, well, you're going to pay for it. So I did. I was thrown in the brig. So, uh, so that was quite an experience. And finally, uh, I think it was, uh, wasn't in a brig very long. I'd have already had office hours, I guess. Uh, if you're in the Navy or the Marine Corps, you know what office hours means. That means your trial, I think. Yeah. So uh, when we got overseas with the fellas, I was in, fellas I was in the brick, they put it right back in the brig again. But I done had an office hours, so I didn't have to go in a brick anymore. And uh, I, uh, I think from uh, Norfolk to. Uh, Norfolk, Virginia, to New Caledonia, New Mia, New Caledonia. We were on the water for about 35, 35 days. Of course, when we got in Panama, well, we, the boiler went kaput again on, our, on this old ship we was on, and uh, they were laid up there for We never got off. And uh, I, one thing I remember about that place, why we was laying, uh, we was on the ship there for about a week, I guess, and. Uh, one uh, one day the the uh, military police come in with this guy that uh, this marine that he'd uh, jump ship from the previous uh, replacement battalion and uh, they brought him back aboard and and uh, and uh, later that day we heard a rifle shot and uh, he had sh shot his ankle foot ruined his ankle. He didn't want to go back overseas again. I would tell you about that. Yeah, I believe you did. And, uh, Once or twice. Yeah. And uh, so uh, that's what I remember about that. And then uh, uh, we uh, we come to New Mia, New Caledonia, and then we went to uh, Guadalcanal in the now this, uh, and, and uh, yeah, I guess it's about 500 miles from there, maybe it went, wasn't that far, but uh, this was in 1943. The war was getting, uh, you know, pretty far along in the war. I'd, uh, I, uh, uh, I didn't, I, mean, I could have got into the uh, CBs that we used to have. Uh, I'm going back a little while now. I used to have a uh, have a Navy recruiters to come through the union meetings to recruit people, you know, carpenters and tradesmen of all kinds. So uh, the, the, uh, most all of the, the CBs were former, were, were union members, not former you, you, you kept You kept your card. And uh, so I, I always got along real good with them. And, uh, oh, well, that was the 17th anti-aircraft battalion that I was in, and they didn't. At that time, where the airplanes were, uh, the Japanese had run out of airplanes, and all their supply lines had been cut, and so we did, really wasn't much to do. So we was, we drifted around to all these islands, to uh, went to uh, New Caledonia and Guadalcanal, Vela La Vela, and back to Guadalcanal again, and then went to, sent to Guam and and uh, Saipan and Tanian. And uh, so we were stuck there for uh, all this going on. It was about five or six months, I guess. And so uh, they needed, uh, they needed, uh, we hadn't been on New Mia very long, or not New Mia, but uh, uh, Bella La Bella very long. They, and the duty NCO come in one day and said, hey, you guys, uh, they were do carpenter work. And I, and uh, I wanted truck drivers. That's what I volunteered first, and then they wanted carpenters. I thought, well, I could do that. So I got a job. That's about all I did was carpenter work in the first five or six months I was overseas. And, uh, and now this kind of ties in with what you were talking about a while ago about the construction battalion and, and yeah. them being for, uh, members of the uh, union. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. 
Okay. C B says construction battalions, mm -hmm. but of course they named them C S E A B E E S C B S. Mm -hmm. That's where they get got their name, mm -hmm. and uh, that's where I met a friend that uh, oh from uh, northern Kentucky. Uh, they uh, they would after we got on this uh, island of Villa Lavella, uh, different people come around. Uh, you know, people from uh, California, one of those uh, Californians in there, in there, and then uh, I remember this fellow from uh, come around. He said, "Anybody here from Jersey?" <laughs> and uh, sure, sir. And then then I thought, well, I wonder if anybody from Kentucky over here. And finally, this fellow, his name was uh, Bill Hutchison. He came along around, and he, anybody from Kentucky. So him and I got together. We had a a big conversation, and uh, he lived at uh, he lived in uh, Pendleton County at uh, uh, Old Lennoxburg. And so after the war, we we visited each other, and uh, uh, and he come over. He was over at the uh, uh, at the veterans. Hospital in Fort Thomas, where I did volunteer work for several years, and he uh, he 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 got something wrong with him. He was over there, and and uh, uh, that's where he, he he passed away while he was coming there. And and uh, one of the stories he he belonged to the Veterans of Foreign Wars and uh, and and uh, and Falmouth and. Uh, and he was a Pearl Harbor survivor. He had uh, been in Pearl Harbor when it was bombed, and he he had that had a plate on his license plate that Pearl Harbor survivor. And he he's telling me he said they when he first joined, why well, they put him up on the table and said now everybody salute him because he 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 was a Pearl Harbor survivor. He said I felt like a four star general, and uh, that's the story about Bill Hudson. But, and, and then he uh, he came by. I had him to come by, where, uh, to tell Nyetta where I was at. And uh, of course, you had to keep everything so secret. I don't want my wife to know where I was at. But by the time he got there, I was already somewhere else. So that didn't amount to anything. But uh, he was he was a nice guy, a nice fellow. I think we have a, a photograph of him and mom yeah. and, and, yeah. He, and mom in his arms. I got a photograph of him holding you when you were a baby. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, uh, and then, uh, well, I, before we move on, I, I, I always enjoyed the story of, uh, uh, well, tell us about the barber chair and then tell us about the, uh, oh. and then tell us about the latrine. Okay, well, uh, as I said uh, before, I was a carpenter, so I, I just built about a little bit of everything. Me and I'd always pick up some somebody to help me, and I'd always pick John Joseph Sullivan, a guy from New York. He he didn't he didn't know he wasn't much of a worker, but he'd tell good stories. <laughs> he'd keep you laughing all the time, and uh, so. Uh, we had an inspection one Saturday morning, and uh, uh, this is a combination tool, and the, in, in the uh, stock of my rifle had fell out, uh, and it had, I'd missed it, and I didn't know what happened to it, and I found that it, it, was, it was all encased in rust. So on this inspection one Saturday morning, the inspecting officer saw that, and that, 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 that is a criminal, uh, uh, is a criminal sin in, in the Marine Corps to let you not take care of your rifle. So I got extra police duty for that. And so uh, he, the uh, officer asked me, he said, you think you could build a barber chair? And I said, well, I, I could build one that would spin around, but it wouldn't jack up and down. And he said, well, that's what we want. So I built a barber chair. and, uh, and uh, it worked real good. I had to go to the over to CB camp to get a couple of steel plates and and uh, and I fastened them in the middle. He spread it around, put cosmoline on the grease on it to uh, to make it slide real easy. And so after that, I always got free haircuts. They didn't cost much anyway, about fifteen cents. So <laughs> but fifteen cents was more at that time than it is today by far. And. Uh, 
And then I built uh, latrines, you know, 24 holders. And uh, so uh, I'd, I'd uh, cut the holes out for you to sit on and, uh, and the uh, uh, rasp them down. They were real comfortable. So we can see you. They, they were real comfortable to sit on and so uh, sometime after that the, uh, the lieutenant or the captain come around and he says, are you Everman? And I said, yeah. He said, you build them, them up a uh, head, I, they call them a head in the, in the Navy, in the Marines. I said, yes, sir. And uh, he said, well, I want you to tear the top of them off and take two befores and plant them down to a real sharp edge. And, and everybody would get a newspaper from home. They'd go out to the latrine and stay there all morning. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to rebuild it, build, build the head. So they weren't quite so comfortable. So they wasn't so kind of, that's right, they were miserable to sit on. You sat on them a few minutes, you'd get paralyzed. And, and another way, they used, on uh, Vela La Vela there, they had a short airstrip. The island was only about five miles long. Of course, it varied in width. And uh, uh, the uh, Marines used to fly their airplanes in there, on the, and, and uh, they'd, uh, they'd, uh, they'd take, you, take the beer up, beer and the soft drinks, and go up about 10,000 feet. When they come back down again, they'd be cold. <laughs> and another trick they had about keeping salt drinks and the beer cold was that uh, was uh, these six by six trucks they call them. They had a had a, uh, a air pump on the on the running board of the truck, and you'd uh, stick this hose down into a barrel of gasoline, and it caused quick evaporation and make your beer cold, make the beer and the salt drinks cold, and. Uh, so, how much more do you want to do? Oh, well, let's see. Uh, tell us a story about uh, the prisoner that they uh, they had you guard. I, that's kind of a that's kind of a neat story. Oh, you mean the uh, the guy turned loose? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> really? Uh, this is one time I had guard duty, and uh, this was on. Uh, let's see. I was on Guadalcanal, and uh, no, I wasn't. it was after I got to Japan, and uh, it, uh, the uh, I had my post to walk, and and uh, and the, the sergeant came out, and he had a young fellow by the nape of the neck, and he said, "Hold this guy while I get the officer of the day." And he said he just stole a jeep, and so uh, I was uh, holding him, and, and he was giving. He said, "Hey, buddy," he says, "I'm I'm over here." I said, "I'm over here, same as you are." I said, "I'm wanting to I'm wanting to get home." Of course, this was later on. Yeah, the war was essentially yeah, over in yeah, Japan and, at this time. Yeah, and uh, so uh, he'd give me a big sad story, and I said, "Take off." <laughs> and I fired my rifle in the air. Boy, when when the uh, officer come back to to the, with the officer of the day to take him over, well, I said he got away. And boy, did he give me a chewing out. <laughs> and uh, this this officer that gave me the chewing out, his name was uh, uh, oh, what's that? What's the name of the, the guy that the, he was head of the Kentucky State Police for a time, and uh, then he became general manager of the Keeneland Racetrack. I can't think of his name, but anyway, he when uh, he told me he he, he didn't tell me he he, he given the whole uh, uh, group of us they uh, told us if we didn't straighten up, he's gonna something have to be done. So uh, he said, there's a guy in here that turned a, a prisoner loose the other day. He said, said, if he gets one inch out of the line, he says, I'm going to nail his butt. <laughs> so uh, so uh, let's see, I'm trying to think of your name. Uh, uh, Started with a B, I think, but I can't. Uh, uh, oh. 
Bassett. Oh, okay. Lieutenant uh, uh, Ted Bassett was his name, and I think Ellen. She she went down to to the uh, races a couple of times down in Kenya. I don't know which area, but I don't think she did. But uh, let's see what what else we got. Here? Okay, what about let's talk about Harry Truman, about how you've always considered well, him your guardian angel. Well, well, I think I had a lot of guardian angels to begin with. Be, be, take out any aircraft or tank, they didn't need any over there. I don't know why they, because uh, the, the Japanese was out of airplanes, but uh, uh, anyway, well, I, went, uh, I went through that training and, and uh, uh, let's see, I, I don't know what I'm trying to lead up to. What did what you, you say before? Uh, about Harry Truman and uh, oh, oh, and uh, and, 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 and his yeah, big decision that he made. Now, yeah, like I said, I had a lot of guardian angels. I think, and, and then I think uh, Harry Truman, uh, when uh, he was one of them, and uh, and then uh, this uh, Lieutenant Colonel Paul Tebbets, that was piloted the the, the uh, Enola Gay, the one that, uh, that dropped the bomb on uh, on. Uh, the A bomb on Nagasaki, but I'm ahead of my story here now. We was uh, we were towards the end of the war there. I guess about two months before the end of the war, we were the, our the, the anti aircraft battalion in was uh, disbanded, which was several of us disbanded. That we put in a replacement center, and we was put into the Fourth Marine Regiment on uh, of the Sixth Division. We was. Uh, we was scheduled to invade Japan, I believe. Uh, I, don't, I might be messed up on this. It was, uh, this was in August, and we were supposed to in, invade Japan in uh, October, I believe. And so, uh, so uh, I, this this was uh, I'd lost my carpenter job at this time, and we was. Uh, in a labor battalion, uh, we unloaded was unloading a beer ship, and uh, we come in uh, th that that evening, and, and at the end of the company street, the radio shack, there's a radio shack there. And I guess that's where Radio Shack got their name. At. They 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 would uh, broadcast news in this inner island over there, and. Uh, but anyway, there's a crowd gathered down by the radio shack, and uh, and uh, and Sullivan so said, "What's going on?" And uh, not exactly in that manner, but that's, <laughs> and, and uh, everybody held their forefinger up to their lips to be quiet. And they was uh, given; they had just dropped the A bomb on Nagasaki. And they were telling how how much destruction it had done, how many it leveled a, 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 almost the whole city, I guess, the way we understood it. But in, 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 and then so many people killed. Was that Nagasaki or Hiroshima? That Hiroshima. Okay. Hiroshima. Uh, yeah, I, I, let let me interject here a little bit. Uh, 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 you were. You, along with uh, your battalion, was scheduled to be part of the uh, uh, ma uh, mainland uh, landing. Yeah, uh, yeah, we were going to be the uh, yeah. So. Uh, and there was, a, I think, the estimate was that they were they were uh, the United States was 50, figuring out figuring out about a million fatalities. Oh yeah, yeah. about fifty percent. Yeah. Cause we're going to have to, but when uh, they dropped the bomb. Uh, uh, I told old Sully, I said, boy, I said, our, gain, our guardian angels come to our rescue because <laughs> we could see the light at the end of the tunnel because I didn't have to write that letter to my wife. And uh, I, 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 hate the, I didn't know what I was going to say to her. So uh, uh, That letter did not have to be written after No, all. that letter didn't have to be written. So uh, uh, let's see. Okay, well, tell us about the lost flute. That's a little bit lighter story. Oh, okay. Well, uh, my wife and I had sent me a, uh, it was a potato thing, <laughs> and I'd lay in my sack there and blowing on that thing, and boy, there'd be shoes come flying at me, of course, you know, a lot of, uh, and uh, so, uh, 
this one fellow, uh, name was last name was Riley, and he was he was a detective from he was from uh, city of New Jersey. But anyway, he uh, he put uh, somebody swiped my flute, and he put a note on a bulletin board. It's a subject one lost flute, and uh, he, he says. Uh, if finder, please return to private airman, says he can found out and he, 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 he got to be sacked any time during working hours. <laughs> <laughs> so, but of course that wasn't the case. Now that was that was on Guadalcanal too. That's quite a while back. I'm oh. ahead of my story here. Uh, that's all right. We're not we're not following things in strict chronological order. Uh, um, well. Uh, give us the details on uh, uh, being uh, discharged uh, from the Marine Corps. Well, let's see here. What do you mean from... Uh, you were, were you not in San Diego when you were discharged? Yeah, I was, no, I was dis discharged at Great Lakes. Oh, all right. Yeah, and... Uh, oh, I was the. We come in when we come back from Japan. Well, we come the, come the northern route. We didn't have anything but khaki clothes to wear, and we only come about 500 miles south of the Aleutian Islands. You know the the northern route, and well, we about froze to death, and uh, we. Uh, I can remember now coming. We get. Had to come up on the top deck to stand on chow line. I remember the wind whistling through the rigging on the ship, and the, and the song. Every time I hear this song, I think it "You Belong to Me" or about mm -hmm. uh, "Fly the Ocean in a Silvery Plane." Mm -hmm. I always think about that song. It, it was sound kind of kind of eerie, up the wind whistling, and and uh, and uh, we eat and then come jump right back in a sack again, and we come into. Uh, San Jose, California, and we couldn't we couldn't get off the ship there, and we come to uh, come to come, come all the way down to San Diego, and we got off, got off the ship there, and we uh, I thought, boy, we're gonna have some nice barracks here to sleep in. First thing we did, go draw. They gave us orders, that go draw your tent out. <laughs> and we slept in a tent for a couple of nights, and then we was put in barracks and. Everything in the world you could, th after starving, uh, well, we didn't starve, but uh, we got, got a little hungry once in a while for things you'd like to have. And, uh, and uh, but uh, you'd get ice cream, all you wanted, and steak, and they really fed you up. And I, I think I got a fat in, a fat in about two weeks' time. We had to stay out there two weeks to wait for the train to come back east to get started back east. So. Uh, So we uh, we come through a town in Ara Kingman, Arizona, and I remember the old wrecked airplanes. Boy, they whole scads and scads of them. And then later on in life, while well, there, and and Ed Shell and myself, we went to uh, went through Kingman, Arizona, and uh, and that's where I sat nurse, if she remembers. The waitress, I think. Yeah, waitress, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, and it, uh, she remembered her plan. She said, she was just a young girl, of course. This, has been, this was about 57, 60 years later, and she didn't remember, but I remember that. And well, what else, anything else about your military years that you'd care to, to mention? I had here on my list um, headhunters. Was oh, oh yes. Yeah. This this was on Villa La Villa, and uh, there was uh, the 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 they, they were people. I guess people, the people lived all over the islands and the Solomon Islands. A lot of times you don't get out of sight of land. And little islands, 
some of them are only an acre or so big, and they, they, uh, these natives are, we call them gooks, which was a very nice name to call them. And uh, they run all over the place in these outrigger canoes, and they would raid islands, and, and this Bella La Bella, 20, 20 years before, they, they were headhunters there, but they was, they was Catholic missionaries, and they, uh, they really had them uh, doing, uh, living by the numbers. They'd have them small, uh, falling out in ranks just like soldiers, and, uh, and uh, they really, uh, they had brought a little civilization to these groups over there. And uh, the, uh, I remember I was in a CB camp there, and this group come in, and there's a five-gallon can about a, about a couple of inches of white paint in it, and he turned that white paint upside down on his head, and that whole white paint running down on him, and it looked real miserable, <laughs> hot and sticky, you know. But he thought it was hot stuff. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Why don't we end this? end this up for today. We'll wrap it up right now. Okay, yeah, there's and a few, few more ID things I think about the, about the, uh, on where we was at on uh, Saipan there. We was up on the north yeah. end of the island. So many, much of the news about, uh, about the Japanese committing suicide. You ever seen that? That, we, that, uh, that was on the north end of Saipan. They, and they'd, uh, They'd run over, they'd jump over the uh, cliff there and kill themselves. And uh, in the caves, they got in the caves there, and of course the Marines had flame through it. They just burned them up in there. But the mm -hmm. war is hell, as German said, mm -hmm. General Sherman said. And so uh, we'd, uh, we'd go back in these caves and they would be uh, bones and, uh, and, and uh, tennis shoes. They had the tennis shoes that, that the toe was one end compartment, it's kind of like a mitt, a mitten, and then the four toes on the other side. And, uh, uh, oh, you'd find the old sports shoes with the bones in there, and then uh, skulls and all kinds of, all parts of the human body was in there. I know on our tankler at the north end of Saipan, we had, <laughs> they had, we had, uh, I never did do that, but the, the fellas, uh, Put the skulls on top of the fence posts and fed them, and so uh, uh, they have too much respect for the dead Japanese. Well, yeah. it's a it's a, a war desensitizing people be, yeah. beca because it's yeah. necessary, yeah. no oh, doubt. Sure yeah, 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 they, it does, it does for a fact. It, well, I'll tell you what, when we when we resume, the next time, whenever that'll be, we'll talk about your returning home. Is that okay? Okay, yeah. Okay, I'll, well, we'll... I'll, uh, well, I can talk about being in Japan. Uh, okay. I don't know if you ever knew it or not, uh, I got this Japanese lady, she made a little... Uh-oh. Uh, <laughs> made a, uh, a little jacket for you out in the parachute. No, I didn't know that. I think it's in there in the... In, in the in the cedar just now. Is that right? Yeah, I told her that I, you could you could use your book and kind of get an idea across them. So across uh -huh. to them. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, anyway, we'll talk about that later. Okay, I'll turn it off and we'll leave. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, it's been a while since we've done this. Uh, I think we left off on September twentieth with uh, Dad talking about uh, returning home from the military service and uh, so on. And what is it now? It's October the 20 what, Dad? Today's about October the 25th? So September the 20th. No, I'm talking about what today is. Oh, today? Yeah. Oh, t today is uh, November the 1st. Oh, is it? Yeah. Okay, so it's been uh, almost f five, maybe six yeah. weeks since we've done this. Yeah. But we're finally back to it. And uh, so, Dad, uh, let's talk about, uh, after serving in the military service, talk about, uh, uh, about your return home um, from the military service. About what date was that? Oh, 
Oh, it was uh, January the 1st. January 1st? I, I thought I'd get home by Christmas, and I didn't. I was, uh, on Christmas Day, I was uh, processed. Okay. And, uh, what was that, 1946? Uh, 19... Well, that would have been 1945. 1945? Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. And, uh, you returned home and... I called, I, I called Nyetta from Chicago. And that I was uh, on my way home, and uh, but I, I got into uh, Cincinnati at the uh, Union Terminal uh, before she got the telegram. She had to really hurry to get over there, get Mr. Flame to drive her over, drive you and and uh, her over there, and uh, and uh, I had to wait for her. I, I called, I called Miss Willett, and she told me that she was on her way. Miss Willett was our landlady. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I had called her from San Diego and uh, had reversed the charges. She never did charge me for it, for that telephone call. You suppose she thought maybe uh, she owed it to you, Dad? Uh, she might have thought that. <laughs> I expect... But she's a real nice lady. Yeah. And uh, uh, her husband had worked on the Panama Canal when they were building it, so what else you got there? Well, um, you returned home to me and to Mom and to a messed up car as I understand it. Yeah, well, yeah, they, uh, I went to uh, go get my car, which is on the, almost on the other side of town, and uh, I looked at it, and it was all beat up and banged up, and I thought, boy, that's not my car. And here at, uh, I had loaned it to George, and boy, he, he really, he uh, messed up the wiring and everything. And, and uh, she reported missing, and they, they found it on Holman Street, and, and it was all beat up and the wires and that. So when I come home, I had to use my terminal leave pay to get my car fixed up so I could go back to work. So I was going to take a couple of weeks off, but I had spent all my money up to get my car fixed up to uh, drive to and from work. And uh, so uh, I worked with Parker Keith for, uh, at that time, or I started working with him and I went back to work and he told uh, Parker went to the dispatcher at camps and he says, uh, Larry Everman is coming back to work. And, Fr and Frank said, well, I don't remember him. Been gone for two years, you know. And uh, so uh, so when I went back to went by the warehouse, well, he, 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 he remembered me then. And so uh, uh, we, we worked together for quite a while, Parker and I did. And, uh, so that's another story I've talked about. What do you want me to talk about? Okay, that? well, best I can, all, what little I can remember is you were the guy that came home from, uh, you were the guy that helped us move out to the Corsi Pike. That was my first, pretty much my first remembrances of uh, of you. You want to tell us about moving out um, onto, to the Corsi uh, Pike from, uh, from 18th Street? Yeah, we were, uh, we had uh, visited Frank and Lula Asher and uh, found out this place was for sale. I think uh, they want six thousand dollars for it, and uh, so uh, uh, we we had a, fellow, a church member at the Southside Baptist Church to move us out there, uh, Ballard Ballard Moving Company, and. Uh, We, uh, we moved there, it was, uh, this was several, this was two or three years after I got out of the Marine Corps. We had, uh, 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 had lived in Oakley, and we moved from Oakley to 329 East 18th Street, and uh, uh, so anyway, when I got home, uh, uh, I think Nida had coached Larry. He says, uh, what to say? And I remember he said, hi, Pop. 
<laughs> and he didn't even know me. <laughs> and uh, what else? What, 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 where we go from here? Yeah, uh, uh, talk about the moving out on the, to uh, De Courcy Pike. How, uh, you took out a loan for the house. You got a GI loan. Oh yeah, that right? I got a GI loan. Uh, I, I forget what it was. Six percent, I believe. Mm -hmm. Four or six percent. And uh, I, I, I liked uh, a little bit of having enough to make a down down payment. So uh, I, uh, I paid out. What the, what the loan didn't cover, I, I'll have money to, to pay the entry, and uh, I had to get the six, I had to pay six hundred dollars when it was the house with the, the Mr. Oscar Hastings, he wanted uh, six thousand dollars and I only, and the house only uh, appraised at fifty four hundred, so I had to furnish the six hundred dollars extra, so I'd been working, doing pitch jobs, Park Keith and I, and uh, and uh, I had the money, the, the 600 bucks, which was a pretty good sum in them days. And, and uh, so uh, I, uh, let's see, yeah. where we go from here, Larry? Well, let's just, let's leave uh, moving out to, to the house. Uh, why, but after you moved out to De Corsi Pike, you still continued going to Southside Baptist, didn't you? Oh yeah, yeah. We went to Southside uh, Baptist. Sure. Tell us, uh, tell us about the uh, joke about the uh, the uh, Iron Curtain raid related oh. to the Sunday school class. I always thought that was entertaining. Well, uh, the uh, the women had their at Southside Baptist Church, and women had their Sunday school class, and in, in one area, and uh, and the men. Uh, our class was another area that had a curtain dividing us, and so uh, Charlie Menifee and or Mr. Reichel Riggs was the Sunday school teacher, and uh, Charlie Menifee and I, he was in his class with a fellow named Sorrell and a fellow named Henderson, and uh, I'm, yeah, I'm not forgot their names, it's been so long ago, and uh, so anyway, why? Well, Everybody would get situated in their class, and uh, and uh, at that time, while uh, the Cold War or the uh, yeah, there's Cold War going on, and the uh, one in one of Churchill's speeches, he said, "Have been an, there has been an iron curtain drawn across from the Adriatic Sea to uh, Yugoslavia," and, uh, and uh, so anyway, uh, they would start to. Uh, We'd get situated in our class, and uh, Charlie Menifee, they, they pull a ar pull a curtain that separates us. And Charlie Menifee said, "Uh oh, here comes the iron curtain." And so that's where he got that from, from the speech that Churchill had made. Well, I'm um, back uh, back to the house on De Courcy Pike that uh, that you bought. I guess what was that about 1947? Yeah, for oh. 1947. Okay. Uh, tell us about the improvements you made uh, to the old house on the course. Oh, well, I, I made a lot of improvements. I uh, 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 built a desk up, so you was in high school at the time, and I built a desk and the drawers back into, recessed them back into the walls, and uh, and uh, made a desk for where you could study. And then I, I had a, the other room, uh, I fixed it up for Ellen. and. Uh, Oh, we did a lot of work to build retaining walls and uh, and uh, kitchen cabinets. I, I made them myself, and and uh, and uh, in, in the kitchen, and, and uh, it, it was it was never, never had a bathroom at the time. It, it, it was uh, for poor people. It was uh, livable. But you did have an inside bathroom, didn't you? Oh yes, this was later on. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and we uh, I built this bathroom, and I, I didn't hardly have enough knowledge on how to do the plumbing work. But uh, I didn't have a stack, so that every time you have to flush, flush the toilet, you'd have I had a little red bucket there that uh, you, you put it down. It would flush all right that way. But if you didn't put some water, extra water in, it wouldn't flush. It didn't. Uh, I, I didn't, didn't have a stack, 
in, uh, for the uh, to prevent siphonage. I guess that's the way you put it. Yeah. And uh, but anyway, uh, it 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 was uh, real nice in comparison to what we did have. Well, what we did have was well, and again, it was one of your improvements when we moved out there. You built a an outside John a, a oh, two holer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah built built the. Uh, Dug a hole and built this outside, John. But in the cold winter time, uh, uh, pretty cold going out there. So I built a contraption down the basement and put a bucket in it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to detail on that. <laughs> I remember. I remember one time using it. The bucket wasn't in it. <laughs> <laughs> that been a catastrophe. <laughs> um, well. I don't remember this, but you said that there was a chicken house in the old at the old house when oh, we moved yes. out there, and you raised chickens for a while. Yeah, yeah, and, uh, that was a that was a bad adventure. I mean, uh, it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't profitable. Let's put it that way. And uh, but uh, I had uh, Dominic, or I believe they called him, and uh, I had them. Uh, and uh, one time, uh, my friend John Duval, he. Uh, Somebody gave him a, a, a what are you fighting? Oh, banny rooster? No, it wasn't a banny rooster. They was a game chicken. They fight. They oh. game cock. I think that's what okay. they call them. And so he wanted uh, he wanted to uh, wanted me to keep that farm, and, and I kept it for a week. He never, he never did show up for this old game cock. He would get in over at Mr. Hansel and come out on his porch and start crowing about 3.30 or 4 o'clock in the morning. And I told Mr. Hansel after that, and he said, what are you going to do about that rooster? And I said, well, I, I hadn't thought about it. And he said, well, if he if he starts crowing tomorrow, I'm going to shoot him. So that's what he did. He shot the rooster. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, and... Uh, Tell us about raising the garden in that wonderful ground down there in the Fairview. Well, I never did raise much of a garden down there. It was too too much clay, and uh, uh, I didn't I didn't have much luck raising a garden. I, uh, I was always busy doing something else. I, I did a lot of work on the old house and uh, uh, you know cabinets and and uh, retaining walls and this. This, that, and the other, everything that goes with uh, with an old house is always something going bad on it. What's, what's next on that? Okay, well, let's, uh, let's go on to Ernest Malloy. Tell us about Ernest. Uh, well, I had, uh, I had, uh, had three good buddies when I lived there. Well, really more than that, but the three I always remembered was uh, my brother-in-law, Roy Hacker, and then uh, I had a, a friend that uh, I worked with some, Al Beasley, and uh, and then Ernest Malloy. Ernest Malloy, if I ever had a friend in this world, I think Ernest was, my, was a really a good friend, and, uh, and uh, we uh, he lived between us and Roy, and uh, uh, we'd always go fishing together. We did a lot of rabbit hunt, hunting together, and uh, so, uh, we'd. Uh, I was a member at Boone Lake Fishing Club, and he, we'd always go fishing out there quite a bit. And of course, I'll, I guess I can tell about that later on about Boone Lake Fishing Club. Like, what else is there? Uh. Well, a little bit more about that. Tell us about Ernest taking up the collection for the Green oh, family. Oh, yeah. Well, er Ernest was a, a uh, I always considered Ernest to be a, 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 a true Christian man. And uh, he would, uh, he, uh, he would, uh, we had a neighbor there out there. I don't know what it's name. You know, well, I don't want to, I'll mention his name. His name was Green. And they had, he had a, he was a real poor man. and. and he, Kind of a character, and uh, had a bunch of kids, and uh, and these kids would uh, they bu they busted. Uh, I know one thing I remember they busted the the uh, the, the windows out of 
the the glass panel out of the storm door, and them kids would cross this jagged pieces of glass, and these kids would crawl in there, and the, and the dogs would too. Nobody would ever get hurt out there. Well, the Lord, I always heard the Lord takes care of drunks and little babies, and that, that, that's the case. He sure took care of them kids. And uh, but anyway, why he got hurt on the on the job as uh, Mr. Green did, and then they, and so Ernest would get out every weekend. Old Ernest would go around the neighborhood collecting money to uh, to uh, to give to him so they could scrape by. Cause you know they get they, all these kids and and. Oh, I won't, I won't say what kind of character he was, but uh, uh, that didn't make any difference with, with Ernest. He did it anyway, but old Ernest would, uh, I always thought he was a good Christian man. Even if he did, he had a beer every night before he went to bed, him and Eleanor. He said it made him sleep good enough personally. I don't see no harm in that. And uh, But uh, never, he never did get drunk. and. Uh, I know we always had a, a great time going rabbit hunting. We, uh, we, uh, and him and Al Beasley and myself, we we really enjoyed going rabbit hunting. And uh, I know one time I, I had this uh, uh, hunting coat full of uh, rabbits, and we was tired. And, and, it was about the middle of the afternoon, we sat out on some stumps out in the woods. And, uh, we talking about uh, about Jesus, the Savior and Redeemer, and he said, "Well, Ernest said I don't know. So I've did so many bad things in my life." He said, I, "I don't. I might be beyond redemption." And I said, "No, Ernest said uh, that's for Jesus died for your sins." So. Uh, but anyway, I remember that conversation we had one time, sitting out in the woods on some stumps with, with all these rabbits. <laughs> and, and I know we come in, and out at Mr. Menifee's, and uh, and we'd be so tired we couldn't hardly drag ourselves up the hill, big steep hill there, and the dog would jump a rabbit up on top of me and run back down the hall again, and more back down the hall we went, and, and all these rabbits. And we we so tired we couldn't hardly get back up the hill again. And, uh, and we get home night, I would be a little aggravated. She'd have meal waiting out, and we wouldn't be there to eat it without rabbit hunting. But that all goes with life, I guess. Well, she knew where you were, and she knew you was not into no good. So there's a lot to be said for that. Yeah. Um, what about some projects you and Ernest did together? I know uh, well, he uh, helped you paint your house, and you put on several roofs together. And oh yeah, well, uh, Ernest was uh, like I said, we was really very good friends, good buddies, and uh, um, we had we bought a uh, a concrete mixer from uh, Sir Roebuck. We had to put a little motor on it, and boy, we we poured porch floors and basement floors and and uh, and stairs uh, on the outside concrete had to build farms and, and then we mix the concrete and put in there and we uh, put a put a porch floor in for Ernest and for Roy and then I, I, I poured some uh, steps on the in the going oh when you live on a hillside you got to have steps you know so uh, we 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 was very very busy. We of course uh, we, we wouldn't be able to do that nowadays. But we was young then, so uh, we always had a project going on and trading work. And I, I traded work with uh, with Ernest and uh, and we when I built my bathroom, all we had I did go dig a big hole for the septic tank and uh, and uh, and. We'd, uh, it was in hot weather, and Ernest would say, yeah, we'd be digging this trench out to lay the pipe in and, and to the dry well. I, I don't even think we had a dry well. We just run it out over, over the hill. 
to the ditch and uh, it'd be hot and uh, be in hot weather and we'd be sweating like um, um, uh, we'd be sweating pretty profusely and her Ernest said well it says the Lord says I'll uh, I'll put it, I'll lay it in all of them as much as I can, and when it gets so hot, then I'll sit, send a breeze. I already always remember you saying that. Um, you and Ernest, uh, when, when the little neighborhood that we lived in incorporated into Fairview, and I guess that would have been in the middle 50s or something like yeah, that. I think so. Uh, you and Ernest and several of the other neighborhood men would uh, uh, always ran for city council. And I remember uh, um, Ernest, uh, and they, the mayor would always be the one that garnered the most votes. And that would always, uh, I would always be Ernest. Ernest yeah. And I think you generally came in second. Yeah. Tell us about the time that uh, well, you became mayor of Fairview. Tell us about well, that. Well, that was a mistake. There's something wrong with the voting machine. I tried to wiggle out it. I didn't want to be mayor. And old Ernest, he said, well, you, you've been elected. You've got you to go ahead and, and be the mayor. So I, I did, but I, I made it for mayor. I know that. Listen to, listen to a lot of complaints and that. And, uh, well, I remember that. Just we talked. Uh, Ernest wound up only having five votes. Yeah. And uh, well, that, in 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 our family and in Ernest's family, there was five votes. So there was obviously some. And, and Ernest didn't even get to serve with you on that uh, council. You know, <laughs> uh, that was a sad experience. I know. I remember that. And. Uh, well, anyway, well, when, uh, I don't know whether, I guess Ernest was mayor, and uh, that is when the fire department was uh, forming uh, here in Rowland Heights, and uh, so uh, Ernest and uh, Ray Hansel and Al Rutledge and myself, we, we were the ones that had to come up and talk to the people up here at Rowland Heights. And, you know, so we'd be be represented, and we'd under you know that's when they was forming the volunteer fire department, and uh, so uh, we, they raised money. We made enough money to uh, buy a new fire wagon, uh, Aaron's Fox. I remember that was the name of a brand new fire wagon, and uh, they they got a building built up. We had a place to keep the fire wagon, so. One thing I always remember uh, that, uh, well, we had insurance on a good thing we did. And, uh, uh, this, uh, on the first run of the thing, made that nobody was designed, uh, you know, everybody run it and nobody was really an expert at it. And so uh, the first run we had, the uh, fellow run it, I won't mention his name, and run it over the hill and completely demolished the thing. So <laughs> good thing we didn't fart. And I, I was telling telling that to my friends over at Camps and uh, fellow Triple, Bob Triple. I told him that. I told him about the time we uh, 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 killed a hog and, and it was in hot weather and we cut his throat and let him bleed. And, uh, and uh, Bob Triple said, man, that sounds sound like a bunch of hillbillies. <laughs> 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 I was always uh, kidding about being a Kentuckian over where I worked, but uh, I, they seemed to always like me, so I just let it run off of my shoulder. I didn't, pay no, I didn't get insulted from being called a hillbilly. Uh, in fact, I was. I come from down the mountains of Kentucky. I come from a real, real, real poor, poverty-stricken people, so uh, I think that uh, uh, nickname fitted me pretty good. <laughs>